Good evening, everybody. Thank you and welcome to this MS Views and News program. And I say MS Views and News because there is a large organization out there that a lot of people think that every small organization is part of, but we're not. We are MS Views and News, and we provide educational programs for those affected by multiple sclerosis. And we do that by live programs, and we do this on the internet. And so we just like to let people know who we are and what we are doing. Before I go any further, I want to thank Biogen IDEC for sponsoring us to do tonight's program. Again, we want to thank Biogen and the pharmaceutical industry because we do our programs based on the grants that we get from the pharmaceutical industry who wants the patients to know everything that there is to know about multiple sclerosis. Our programs are comprehensive programs. Okay, and we say comprehensive because you're not attending a program where only one drug is being spoken about, but with the good help of the neurologists that we have speak at our programs, or nurse practitioners, they speak about all the current therapies that are out there, and then about the emerging therapies as well. So in addition, though, to Biogen IDEC, we want to thank Genzyme, Accorda, Biogen IDEC, for also providing funds to do tonight's program. So I want to say thank you to all of them, and I hope you do too. Again, for those that don't know, my name is Stuart Schlossman, and I guess you're getting Stu's Views and MS News, which started one week after I was diagnosed back in 98, and that was, we started doing that because there were people at a support group that knew nothing or knew where to get information about MS, and so I started providing this to a small group of 20, which now gets to over 35,000 in over 90 countries. So, thank you. All right, tonight's program. We're gonna have Dr. Brian Steingo, who most of you know, and he will be speaking about what I just spoke to you about. He'll be speaking for about 40 minutes, after which we'll then do Q&A. When we're finished with the Q&A, we're then gonna have Jeff Siegel, and Jeff Siegel is going to speak with you all about how to reduce pain that some of you might have from your MS, spasticity and otherwise, and how exercise is going to help with this. So without any further ado, let's get started. My name is Jeff Siegel. I'm a personal trainer in Boca Raton. That's where I live and that's where I work out of. I go to people's homes. The majority of the people who I train do have MS. And I've been pretty helpful with most of them. Some of them don't do what they're supposed to do, and that's on them. But when I'm with somebody, I give people exercises I know that they're able to do. And if something goes wrong, it's on me. So there's no pressure for them. Today what we're talking about is pain. How many of you experience pain with MS? What kind of pain? Now, I want you guys to throw some of this stuff at me. You don't need the microphone. I just want to know what I'm going to be talking about, because I'm basing this on what you guys want to hear. Hug? Uh, like the MS hug? Yes. That's something that's difficult to work with exercise. You got to talk to your doctor about it. There may be some uh, pharmaceutical interventions and treatments that you can take that would help that, but I haven't seen exercise to help that completely. So going in line with like what the person asked earlier about these middle of the night leg crampings, what, do you, what can you do or what can we do to help minimize that? I'll tell you, some of, the, some of the things are real basic. Uh, one thing that most people on earth are, and that's dehydrated. How many of you here drink enough water every day? How do you know it's enough? How many of you work behind a desk? Just come home with me. Well, how, how many of you work behind a desk? Any of you? How many of you sit behind a computer? How many of you go on the internet behind the computer and find yourself lost there? And, and it would, time flies, right? You're getting dehydrated. And you're also getting stiff by sitting there. So one of the best things to do is drink more water because if you drink more water, it's gonna force you to get up and use the restroom. <laughs> so you have to get up and elongate your hip flexors. Now hip flexors are a problem for most people with MS who have um, walking issues or uh, mobility problems because the hip, flexors, the hip flexors don't activate properly sometimes, and that's uh, kind of in the whole process of drop foot. But if you sit at a desk all the time, or if you're sitting in the chair all the time, or you don't stretch out enough, your hip flexors get short and tight. 
So most of the muscles on the front of your body become shorter and tighter. Does that make sense? If you look around at everyone's posture, you gotta wait about 30 seconds because everyone's sitting up straight right now. But in 30 seconds, that'll go away and you'll see people doing this. So what this does is this causes um, tightness in the chest, it, it elongated back, and you, you're losing the fight with gravity. And what eventually happens is you're leaning forward and your hip flexors start to get tight. When the hip flexors start to get tight, one of the hip flexors is attached into your lumbar spine, and that's your psoas, and when that gets tight, your back starts to hurt. So loosening up is one of the most important things that you can do. Now, when you're loosening up, and uh, you know, if you loosen up here and there, it's better than not at all, right? It's just like any exercise. You ask a lot of people who exercise and who doesn't, and people will tell you what they used to be able to do, not what they're doing now. And that's kind of a scapegoat of, well, I used to do it, but I'm not gonna try anymore because I can't do it how I was when I was at my very best. And that's what everybody usually compares themselves to is uh, what their levels were at the very highest that they ever got, you know, the best and, and most th uh, that they've ever achieved. So one of the most important things about, it, about exercise and stretching, I'm gonna try to talk a lot about stretching. How many of you stretch? When do you stretch? And I don't wanna hear about when you yawn. You know, that doesn't count. Yeah. Well, in the morning, you know, all animals do that. You know, you see a dog, a cat, all these animals, they wake up. The first thing they do is they stretch out and they do that stuff. But you don't see them doing ballistic stretches. They don't like jump into stuff and do that because that, hurt, that hurts them. So one of the most important things about stretching is warming up first. That's why I have this here. So something as simple as this, this is a little bike. Not only can you warm up with it, but you can watch television while you're doing this and you're burning calories while you're watching TV. Not a bad thing to do, um, but you're warming up a bit. You're getting your core w warmed up. Other things that you can do, and that's something that, um, this is assisted or non-assisted. If you plug it in, it'll start it for you, so some people need a little jump start. But you need to warm muscles up first. If you were to take a rubber band, and I'm gonna compare muscles to rubber bands, but if you take a rubber band and you put it in the refrigerator or the freezer, and you take it out after an hour, and you do, do this with it, one of two things is gonna happen. It's gonna either snap, or it's gonna stretch out longer than it originally was, and it won't um, have as much elasticity. And that's what happens with us. So if you wake up and you start doing your stretches, you really wanna warm up first. And some of the ways that you can warm up is just rhythmic movements, um, uh, even a warm shower. I know a lot of people in here probably don't like taking too hot of showers because MS does affect um, you know, it does have some negative effects when you're in the heat. Now, one thing I didn't mention is I also have MS, so I understand what a lot of you guys have gone through or are going through. And I've been living with MS now for, uh, I don't know, just about 17 years. So, and, I, and I've been A to Z with MS. So I, I've had symptoms, but right now I'm feeling great. But there's times during the day that I don't feel great, but then it comes the invisible things. You know, you can't see it, but I feel it. And, and I'll tell you, and most people don't care because I can't see it, so it's the way it goes. But I, I continue to stay active, and staying active is one of the things that will help with spasticity, and that's one of the most uh, common pains that you get is from spasticity, muscle tightness, which leads to contractures. So that's why it's important to loosen up. Uh, you don't, like I said, you don't go into a stretch hard, you slowly go into a stretch. Now there's passive and active stretches. A passive stretch is if you had somebody pushing your leg back, like such as your ham, to do a hamstring stretch because these muscles here tighten up a lot. These muscles here don't tighten up or have as much cramping as the back. Can you guys attest to that? Doesn't you agree? You know why? Because they're on stretch when you're sitting. When you're standing, they're not. If you stood all the time, these muscles might have that problem. But when you're seated, these muscles are shortened. They're not flexed, but they're at a shorter, they're shorter from origin to insertion. These are stretched, because to, to stretch your quadriceps, it would be this motion or laying down and doing that. And then to stretch your hamstrings, these tighten up a lot, or you can get cramps here and in your calves, like when, what we were just talking about when you're sleeping. So some, I'm gonna go back to what, that, what, what he had asked about. How can you stop nighttime cramps? Well, you gotta figure out why do you have nighttime cramps? Is it just MS? Because I know a lot of people who don't have MS who have nighttime cramps, and one of the causes can be lack of electrolytes, just lack of being hydrated, you know, being dehydrated. 
And some of them, um, especially with MS, is tight sheets. How many of you have tight sheets on your bed? Tuck them in. I hope nobody. <laughs> I can't stand that. You know, I used to get cramps in my calves when I played football when I was younger, and, and that's the one thing that I couldn't stand was a tight sheet because your foot goes down and starts the cramp, and it just feels like it's pulling. Do uh, you guys get that? It just feels like it starts, sometimes it starts under the toe and goes all the way up the back of your leg, and next thing you know, it's in your hamstring, and sometimes you can't wake up from it, and by the time you do, you're completely in pain. So I'll show you some of the things. Now, stretching before going to bed is not unheard of either. If you stretch before you go to sleep, that may help reduce the pain or the, um, or the cramping. It so, makes you want to do laundry, huh? <laughs> Makes you want to do laundry? <laughs> well, if you, if you do want to do some um, calf stretches, one of them is this, putting your foot back like this, and uh, and stretch just putting your weight onto it. Another one is to pull on it, is to pull on it from a seated position or laying down. Now I'm gonna get, I'm gonna see what's in this bag of tricks here so I can use some of it. One of the best things that you can do to help a cramp like that with in your bed is to keep something close by such as a towel and, uh, and if you have a towel you can use it like what I'm gonna do with this is when you're laying down as soon as you get that cramp, the, the, the most important thing to do is not bend your foot down, not plantar flex. It's dorsiflex, so you can hold it with something like this, or if you get a strap of some kind, to pull it like that, and, uh, and that stretches it out. Usually a cramp would stop pretty quickly if, uh, if you pull on your foot such as that. Now one thing you don't want to have happen is when you're doing a stretch for your hamstring is to feel it behind the knee. So some hamstring stretches, do you guys remember in PE, the hurdler stretch? Um, well, a hurdler stretch used to be this. It used to be here, and they'd have you stretch down to it. That's gone, that's been eliminated because it causes too many problems with the medial collateral ligament. So this here is uh, the modified hurdler stretch. This is a very good stretch for, uh, for the hamstring. It also helps the calf. Now, what are some other places where people have pain? Let me get some suggestions because I'm... Neck. Your neck? Okay, if your neck is always stiff, that's something that, that you may want to talk to a physical therapist or your doctor about to find out why it's always stiff. There could be a cause. It could be the way you sleep. It could be your pillows. It could be, um, it, it could be just about anything. I mean, so you want to find out what the cause is. If you haven't changed the pillows that you're using and you still have a um, stiff neck, change the pillows, but you can do some rotational exercises before or when you get up, or you can just do some holds like this, and, uh, and like this, or, um, or just lay on the bed and do some extensions and flexion to the neck. Just remember, if you flex your head down like this and you have lermits, you want to be careful. And that's something that goes for all exercise. If you're at the gym especially, make sure that your form is correct and do not flex at the chin. If you flex your neck, then you can get that shocking feeling and you can um, drop whatever you're doing and it becomes dangerous. Any other places? Let's hear what other kinds of pains do you have? Back pain. Hey, back pain is another thing. Now, that's, that, now I'm going to move into the core. Your core is very important because if you, if you have a str the stronger your core is, the less likely you may have spasticity in, in your extremities. Because <clears throat> everything's central, and then you know, it goes peripheral from there. So if, you're, if, you're, if your back is not strong or if it's tight, you're going to have problems with it. And, and the, the solution is stretch and strengthen. So a, 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 a tight muscle is, can be weak or a, an overflexible flex muscle could be weak as well. So the, the answer is strengthen it and stretch. So some of the good stretches for your back are um, laying on your back. Now these you can do in bed. This is the first one, is the simplest of them, is just to hold your, your knees to your uh, chest. Or you can do one at a time. This one here would stretch your hip flexor on this leg and go into your back on this leg. Uh, and then, you know, you want to alternate and do both. Uh, the other things that happen is 
When you get a signal that's incorrect that goes down, that's what we have is we've got kind of frayed, uh, frayed wires, I, I like to call it. With MS, there's the signal that comes from here that goes to the toe, then as distal as it gets, gets broken up if you have lesions in certain places. So you never know what the outcome is going to be. But one of the outcomes may be um, muscular co-contractions. That means that you have antagonist muscles, which are the non um, the muscles that are not being used, and then there's agonist muscles. And the agonist muscles, and I'll use the bicep and the tricep as an example, this is an agonist muscle. This is pulling up, and when I'm pushing down, this was the antagonist, now it's the agonist. Does that make sense to you? There's one side that's, on, that's going to be working, and there's one side that's not going to be working. But in order to flex, when, you do, when you're making a muscle like this, you have to use both. Because what's happening is, in order to do this and make this tight, this has to work against it to prevent it from going all the way, you know, and, and then you're flexing both sides. Now, if you have some spasticity issues, it's going it, to, the problem can be co-contractions, which would prevent you from doing something like this without the resistance, because if you're trying to pull and your tricep is, is contracting as well, now you've got a tug of war and you get nowhere and it causes pain. So one of the things that you can do is, um, usually cold will make that a little bit worse, heat will make it better. That's another thing that, that can go for stretching and warming up is a passive warm up would be to put something like a warm towel on your, um, on your leg or wherever you're going to stretch. And then after that, after you've kept it warm for a little bit, that's when you want to start stretching and slowly go into it. Slowly go into it. Um, now, this is what I was talking about, how I was saying slowly go into a stretch. If you go to here, you, you don't want to feel too much discomfort because you could be hurting yourself. You want stretching to be a, comfort, a comfortable thing that you're doing. Yeah, you will feel a little bit of, of straining, but uh, you, you don't want to feel it back here. If you feel it behind your knee, you ever stretch and you feel it curve behind your knee, that means you're stretching a tendon and those don't stretch. Those snap. <laughs> so, so you want to be careful. One of the things that you can do to stop that is bend your knee a little bit and then go for it. You're still getting the stretch here and it's not going to affect the tendon. Um, tell me some other areas that you have spasticity or tightness that you want to know. How, is there any muscle groups or areas that you want to know how to stretch that you don't know how to right now? Rhomboids. Rhomboids. Okay, so if you want to, your rhomboids are, are right here. Part of your shoulder girdle. One way to do that is to bring your arm around like this. One of the other ways that you can do it, I mean, if you pull it this way, it's kind of tricky. You can stretch your posterior delt and that will take on the whole stretch rather than your rhomboid. But if you pull your arm out and stretch it, then you can go all the way into the rhomboid. Another way to do the rhomboid would be if you had a band or even just a, uh, something to hold on to. If it's a door, this is a way to stretch the rhomboid. You kind of got to get a feel for it. You kind of, um, who asked the question about rhomboid? Was it you? Uh, so if, if, you, if you hold on to something here and you, and you turn, Sometimes you can just find it, you know, that's, that's the way to do it. Or you can even just hold your arms out like that. Um, but tight rhomboids are, I mean, they're the, they're the most common muscle rhomboids and mid-traps that you want to get a massage on. So that you get a lot of myofascia buildup. And one of the things that you can do is use something like a foam roller. What I like to do is lay down on a tennis ball or something like that and roll around on it a little bit and that loosens it up. That's um, another way that you can get loosened up or, or, break the, um, or break a spasm. Now, a medicine ball, yep? Uh, poor exercises if you have balance issues. <clears throat> seated. Seated or on all fours. You're more stable when you're seated. Um, let's see. One thing that I like to do, I, I just this goes into that, is every time I work with somebody who's able to sit on a stability ball, which everybody I work with is able to. If I have to hold their hands, I hold their hands. But that's how I start the warm up, from the core out. Start out on a ball like this, side to side. Um, one of the best core exercises, and, and go in circles, and go the other way. And you can do that for about five minutes or so. And, you know, five to 10 minutes, however long you feel comfortable doing it, get a little bit loosened up that way. 
but uh, that, that's something that works your core. Now when you're seated, I love working with balloons. Who is it you that asked about the core? Who? You. Um, if, if you can't stand or if you have trouble standing for long periods of time or even if you're able to stand for a long period of time, if you keep your feet close together and someone throws something such as a balloon towards you, uh, try to stay as stable as you can and reach for it. You know, it's hard to grab, but that's a great core workout, just by grabbing something like a balloon. How many of you here have seen me speak before and I've taken a balloon out? Um, I don't have any balloons with me today, I don't think. If I do, I will show you what I mean by using the balloons for that. Um, Use a big ball instead. But Yeah, you can do that. Uh, another thing that's important is working out on all planes. You know, you've got um, rotational movements, you've got vertical movements, horizontal movements. One thing I like doing is with other, either a medicine ball or even something as big as a stability ball. And if you have problems with stability, I like to talk more stability than balance because it, it's easier to do this than it is to do this. And if you can't do this, I wouldn't advise you to try that. So you work on this to this to that over a long period of time. <clears throat> chops. Have any, have any of you seen me show, what, show you guys an example of chops? You, get, so you can use a water bottle, you can use um, a bouncy ball if you fill it up with water, a medicine ball, um, just about anything. This is four pounds, it's, I think. Yeah, four pounds. Chops are here. Did I get loud? <laughs> I do these. You know, about 30 motions. One, two, three. It's working out the horizontal musculature of my core. Uh, rhomboids, internal, external obliques, traps, those make up like a serape around your body, which is what your core is. You know, your core is built, if you look at the muscles in there, that's, what it, that's how it's created, your serratus interior. Um, so you do each direction that way, then you can go up and down and side to side. Now after doing that, you're pretty warmed up in your upper body. If you do it on, the, on your feet and you're standing, it would look like this. And then this way. And this is doing all the above. This is loosening me up. This is stretching. It's, it's an active stretch. Uh, it's getting my body, my core warmed up. And by the time you're done with it, maybe you'll be feeling a little bit better. If not, you keep going on to something else. A lot of the pain that I had in the past was the tingling in the feet and pins and needles. Anyone ever have that? Well, something that happened with me, it doesn't mean it's everybody, but that prevented me from exercising like I had used to at one point because of fear, because I was afraid oh, it's gonna get worse. Once I started doing some more movement and, and exercising, and sometimes it just didn't get worse, it stayed the same. So if it stays the same, it's not getting worse, may as well do something while it's feeling that way. Um, if it gets worse, you talk to, uh, you talk to your doctor about it. Um, so any other questions? Do you have a question? Yes, I know you talked about prevention of cramping. Yeah. Okay. If you cramp, I do a lot of kayak. Yeah. I don't drink enough water, so I start cramping in my feet. And I can't move because I'm, I'm in a nice little boat and I'm, I'm, what do I do to get rid of this cramp that's going in my leg? If your leg is bent, you're in trouble. <laughs> if you're crouched there, first thing you said that you hit it on the button was you're usually dehydrated. Well, I know why, but what do I do if, if I have these cramps? Um, I, I would try to get nice and loosened up and a good stretch prior to going kayaking. What happens if it happens? How are you if you're, you mean, right if, middle, how do you get rid of the cramp in the middle of the cramp? Well, if you, if it's a, if a cramp comes, all the stretches I was just showing, if it's in your calf, you see, but you're stuck in a kayak. Right. Well, so okay. if you can, can you get your leg out, one leg out, without flipping? Not in the ocean. Yeah. Well, I would try to stay a little closer to shore. <laughs> Is there any way to loosen your, loosen that? Yeah, there is. I mean, you can do self-massage on it, and sometimes that will do it. But the problem is elongating the muscle or putting it on stretch is, is going to stop that reflex of, um, of it catching. And when it's not stretched, it can continue to go. Yeah, you can do a little bit of uh, like myofascial release with your hands. That's about the best bet. Um, 
or putting something, maybe some heat on it out there. I don't know what you have, or, or I'm, play, I'm sure it's, if you're out in the ocean, there's something near that's hot, or you may be even putting a paddle on it. I don't know. But, uh, but that's something you should talk to your doctor about. What can you do to prevent it? Because that's the best solution is prevention. I know how to prevent it. Well, so then you, don't have, you won't have the problem anymore. <laughs> See, we're, it's solved. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Um, another, another problem can be adductors versus abductors. Do you guys know the difference between an adductor and abductor? That was one of the most difficult things for me to learn when I was um, figuring out anatomy and, and physiology and kinesiology was what's the difference between an abductor and an adductor? One starts with an ABD and one is an ADD. You add together as an adductor, and I was always told ABD, a bad date, run, go away. <laughs> so. <laughs> So that was how I remembered it. So this would be abduction of the legs, and this is adduction. So those muscles sometimes work against each other, and that causes some spasticity. Anybody here have spasticity in here or out here? Or coming into there like that? Does that ever happen? Usually that comes from the back. Now I can tell you some other things that are helpful to prevent, um, to prevent some of the back pain and some of the um, shooting pains in your legs is strengthening your core. And, and constantly reminding yourself to keep a tight core. And one of the ways to keep a tight core is I want whoever's listening right now to try this. Try to sit up straight. Now try to make yourself, while seated, two inches taller than you are. Try to make yourself taller. And what you're doing is you're activating your transverse abdominus, which is the deepest muscle in your abs. And now if you do that, um, a lot of times that can alleviate back pain in itself. Another thing is when you're walking, these are obliques. Um, if you know how to contract your obliques and you practice doing that, that can also help back pain or prevent some spasticity. When you talk about <clears throat> strengthening your core, is that the same thing as just your strengthening your abdomen? Uh, sort of. Um, I mean, doing crunches does make your abs stronger, but what you want to do is, is more something a little more functional. That's why I love doing the bands, because if you're standing and you're doing a band press, then what you're doing is you're contracting your, your abs to prevent you from falling back. Another great thing to do is a plank. Anybody in here know how to do a plank? Um, a plank, you can do a, uh, the easier way to do a plank would be with like a push-up position and just hold that or go down here or do a little bit of a combination of that because that gets a little more activity. Um, there's also, you can do them on your knees. So if you're out here and you're, and you're in a plank, the lever arm is a little shorter so you're not getting as much tension on your abs, but you're still getting a workout. Um, another thing I like doing is motion with the hands, which Let's see what I have in my bag of tricks. These, furniture movers. Um, I love doing stuff with the furniture movers because easier to move furniture, right? If you do it right. Some of the things that you can do is even put your arms on them and you know, do stuff like that. There's all kinds of stuff that you can do with that. Um, but that, that's a great way to strengthen this side of your core. Now to strengthen this side of the core, well you can do the exact opposite if your shoulders are strong enough and do something like this. Now what's in between the floor and me is my back and that's holding me up. So if you were to feel my back, you'd see it's all contracted back there. Then you have your obliques, which a side plank is very important to do. Side plank would be here um, or even there or there. You know, you see all kinds of different variations of it. But you do what you're able to do. You can do it on your knees, too. Can you some exercises that we can do from uh, sitting down in our chair without getting up? Yeah, I'll show you something. Let's see. Well, it depends how much mobility you have. Because you don't, it, I want to give you something that's not going to make you fall out of your chair. Are you talking about doing something by yourself or with someone else? I'm talking about um, getting the initiative going. Okay. You can do crunches in the chair. You just got to sit out at the end of it. That's a crunch. Right? Is that, that's something that you can do in your chair. 
or if you were to sit here and go back. Now you're working your lower back. Or you, you can go side to side with, with things. Or if you did something with one arm, a press was it with a weight, something weighted. In order for you to do the press, you have to stabilize yourself with your obliques to prevent you from take, coming down with the weight. So those are things you can do um, while seated. Uh, some other things you can do seated, if, if you have mobility in your legs, that's another thing that I have some people do with their warm up is take these furniture movers. Seems simple, it's not as easy for everybody, but for, you know, for some people this is very difficult. For some people, just to get this much movement is a big accomplishment. Where you might not be able to do that because your hip flexors might not be able to lift your leg to put it forward and back, but you're using your quads and your hamstrings. But I like doing that as a warm up for some. Did I answer your question for some exercises in the chair? The balloon is my favorite thing in a chair. Have somebody throw you a balloon. And you sit in the chair, and you, if you have to reach to catch it, you're using your core. Because that's what's preventing you from falling over. If it goes up high, if, if it's here, um, and you're not getting up, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? It hits the floor. If, it's in, if you're on grass, it'll pop. Who sits in a chair on grass? That, ca that can't walk. You know, it doesn't happen. So, anybody else? Hold on one second. I'm coming with the mics. Oh, thank you. I notice um, that when I'm in classes doing like core exercises, you know, the exercises where you're flat and you have your legs out, I have real hard time keeping my legs up. Is that MS related? It may be. Um, it's kind of the same thing as what I do with clients on the first visit and as a reassessment is I'll have them do th things, some things like something like this. And I know it's MS if all of a sudden, after you're doing a, a few of these, it starts to be like that. And I, now I know that this side is the affected side. Same thing could be for holding your legs up. Um, but the only way to really tell is, uh, I mean, does it matter if you can improve it? Well, I just, I just noticed, I mean, I can do the part where it's, it's my ab working. So um, where basically the exertion is coming from but the ab. But if it's the I hip flexors. The legs. Yeah, I can't keep the legs up. Okay. Like they, they end up yeah, little well that, by little coming Usually down. that sounds like it's MS. Okay. I mean, if, if your doctors talk to you about that, have you ever talked to your doctor about hip flexors? Yeah. Well, you could tell if it's hip flexors if you ever just march in place. Because most people can do this forever. People with MS sometimes have a little deficit and they'll start doing, and eventually they can't, and eventually they're just hiking up their hip. Okay. Um, so that's something that you can try. Sometimes, even if it is MS, um, what you'll end up doing is, I see people doing a, a hip flex, uh, get into a hip flex position, but what they're doing, they turn their foot and they externally rotate their hip and they do it. And if you see your foot coming out when you do it, what's happening is your hip flexors are not properly activating and your adductors, these muscles here that are supposed to keep your legs together, take over, which is good and bad. The wrong muscles are working, but the right motion is working. So as long as you, it, it, some, some people don't care if they get from A to B um, straight, zigzag, as long as they get from A to B. So that's something that, you know, you, you develop new pathways sometimes. I see. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, because I don't know what I was, I have no idea what I just said. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I just want to make sure you guys are listening. Uh, would you speak specifically about foot drop exercises? Okay, foot drop exercises. Um, you know, doing uh, dorsiflexion, lifting your foot up and down and up and down. That's something that's going to help with those muscles. The problem is um, when the signal's lost, you can't do them anymore. So I would do them in intervals because sometimes if you can get your foot up off the ground, um, pick a number and try to hit that number. And then take a, take a two minute rest. Try to hit that number again. If you can get more than it, get more than it. But that's something that you can try to do. Now walking in an incline is also something that's going to help with drop foot if you're able to do it. But you know what the problem is, there's, there's devices that are helpful. You know, sometimes if you have drop foot bad enough, there's the AFOs or sometimes the Bionis or the Walk-Aid, those types of things. Have you ever tried something like that? 
Um, so th those are things that will get those muscles working again. It's mechanically doing it, but it's still doing it. What about <clears throat> severe, <clears throat> severe low back pain uh, all the way through the back where <clears throat> just ice or something doesn't help? Well, if it's spasticity, ice is going to bring it on. Ice is going to make it worse. So putting some heat on it might help before doing any kind of stretching. Uh, you know, localized heat usually doesn't have a negative impact on MS as much as being in like a sauna or something like that where everything is hot. The ice eases the pain on the ceiling thing. <clears throat> the ice might make the pain subside a little bit, but it's not going to decrease the spasticity. It's going to increase the spasticity. So if you can put something warm on it, the real way to do it is warm before, stretch, loosen up, ice afterwards. And then you'll have better, some better result, results with it. Anybody else daring enough to ask a question? Oh, I, I have a question. Um, actually, two things. Oh, I talk pretty loud anyway. Um, uh, first thing, aside from dehydration, isn't magnesium deficiency um, it can't attributed to, to it? Uh, magnesium. Uh, all the electrolytes are, are important. You know, you want to have your potassium and you want to have, you know, something like a, a sports drink might, might do it for you. Right. Enough water. If you have too much water, you can also have lack, uh, a lack of electrolytes because you may not be getting some of the other things. So a little bit of glucose solution or something like that, or an orange or something, or a banana. Those are very helpful. Right. My other question is, what are your thoughts on vibration plates? On what? Vibration plates. Uh, like a power, power, power plate and that type of stuff. The, the, I'm not a big fan of them. Um, they, they have their place because most people, for someone who has a problem with stability, sometimes that can disrupt that signal a little bit more just from, ex from personal experience of working with it. Sometimes it can do the opposite and it can be very helpful. But I can tell you that if you're willing to do something on one of those where normally you wouldn't do it, then they're great. Just like one of those shake weights, those shake weights, they don't do anything more for your muscle than a regular weight, except they're more exciting to use. So people use them. But, uh, but I think that the power plates have their place. You can get some better stretching with them sometimes because the shaking does allow you to get a little bit further. And, but it's best to do it with somebody else, have somebody else help you with it so you don't get hurt. But any, If you can move the muscle, you can, you can strengthen the muscle. So yes. If you can't move the muscle, then I'd say, you know, without having something like a, a, a bioness type of thing, you're going to have more atrophy. Um, but if you can move the muscle, you can build the muscle. You know, even if it's a little bit, because if, a little, if you do a little bit and it's a little bit more than you were doing, then you're gaining a little bit. And a little bit and a little bit and a little bit adds up. You then you. My problem is mostly leg weakness. So by doing the warm ups, that would loosen the whole body? Yeah. It, yeah, it, it should loosen up the whole body because it is, it's, a, it's a good and bad thing. You're increasing your core temperature so the muscles get a, a little more elastic, but you're increasing your core temperature so you may want to put something around your neck or something as a cooling device. Um, you had a question, didn't you? Okay. Um, my question was about winging. Have you heard about winging? Winging? Yeah. yeah no, give me a hint. It's kind of similar to atrophy, like um, because of the muscle not working. Like um, it's in the back, it's in the shoulder. So like strengthening your shoulder. Okay, so there's muscles. a lot of things that you can strengthen your shoulders with. Um, one of the things would be uh, laying down on your laying down flat. That's strengthening your rhomboids, mid traps, posterior delts, or doing a uh, modified Superman, something like that, or doing a, these. Oh, I hate those. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the most important exercises out there are the ones you like the least. That's what I get. I'll tell most of the people I work with. They'll say, "Oh, do we have to do those today?" And I tell them, "We don't have to do anything today, but if you want to get the most out of the workout, you got to do those." Any other questions? 
Are you giving us a card? A card? Like a birthday card? Is it your birthday? <laughs> I might have some cards in, in there. If not, I'll give you my contact information. I usually bring a PowerPoint and I have everything up there so you can copy it down. But uh, I'll tell you my, my website is www.balancedpersonaltraining.com. And there you can find all my information. Or my email address is jeff at balanced personaltraining.com. <coughs> Questions, anyone? I'm not sure if this is necessarily an MS-related question, but um, I've Remember, had... every qu any qu okay. all questions are good questions. <laughs> um, I've had ankle fusion, well, attempted and then real <laughs> ankle fusion twice in the last year and a half. Um, so that leaves my right ankle. I had it in June this um, past year, and I was in a cast through the whole month of September. Um, I was walking okay by the end of October. Be and doing, for drop foot? No, um, just for um, subtalar, just okay. subtalar arthritis that had no no um, cartilage left. So I did ankle fusion. Um, that was after about 12 years of getting cortisone injections. So. But now, I was walking pretty well in December, um, but now I have significant pain in the bottom of my foot. By the end of the day, my foot is in so much pain, not so much my ankle. Um, the bottom of your foot? The bottom of my it, foot. It, it, I, it may be plantar fasciitis, I don't know, but okay. a doctor should be able to pick up on that pretty quick. Okay. Ask them about it before you do anything, okay. <laughs> you know, because you don't want to tear anything. That's the last thing you want to have happen. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? There's a lot that I'm not telling you now because I'll be speaking again and you guys got to come back and hear the rest. <laughs> so my thanks to Jennifer and, and Jeff. Jennifer and Jeff, there we go. And for everybody coming down here today, oh, we got to do raffles. I need the tickets outside. Can somebody get me the tickets? Thank you, Carmen. Um, by the way, for whoever wants to venture up to Vero Beach next week, we're doing a program up in Vero. And Jeff will be there too, and he's gonna do something different than today. So um, if you wanna, like I said, come on up there, then just look at all the emails. Go to the website, go to where we have the calendar of events or where it says register now. Click on that button and just register for the next program. Okay. And can I say something real quick? No. Right quick. <laughs> If I'm ever speaking and you have the cards in front of you and you want something covered that I don't cover, put it on the card and pass it up because then we can improve the programs and they're for you guys, so that's how we make it better. I forgot to tell everybody here something really, really important. We hired our first full-time employee just recently. And that full-time employee is a social worker. And that's the community service that MS Views and News is now gonna be providing, beginning in the state of Florida, and then hopefully expanding out when we can keep on growing. And this social worker is gonna be able to provide you with resources for needs that you might have um, with, with regards to finding services, whether it be for if you're using adaptive devices or, or, needing, um, or needing to find the right physician or it doesn't even have to be just about MS, okay? It could be about other things as well, although, you know, we would like it to stay to MS. But also, she can bring you, yes, it's a she. I don't know if I said that earlier, but it is a she. And uh, we'll be making a press release on this, on this person within another week, and so you'll find out more about it at that time. We also now have an 800 number, which will be releasing that information at the same time. So you'll be able to call that 800 number. Am I missing anything on this? Just yell it out. Go, go ahead. What? Right. Okay. So when you need to find like certain medications and you may not be able to know or know where to resource this or different insurances that might have or where you can get the dollars to be able to afford these different medications, she'll be able to work with you on this as well. She'll be... Not yet. So, <laughs> so 
in addition to that, it, it's like things like um, you may need to find assistive devices and you don't know where to go to or how to, or how to go about getting the funding for that in case you don't have the funding for this, in case it's just beyond your resources. Also, we'll be able to help you out getting you um, for the persons that are out there that might have a low income and they don't know where they could get dollars from to be able to maybe pay their rents or to pay medical bills or to do other things that they just have to do, the social worker will be able to work with you and to find out where you can, you know, where you can apply to get these kinds of dollars. Okay, so this is, it, it's very much in, very much more detailed than even what I'm talking about. Um, and again, this information will be released shortly. We're going to come out with a full list of everything that this person is going to be able to do for you along with the 800 number and we hope that even if you do not need the services, that you'll be able to tell somebody else that might be in a support group that you attend or, or people that you just know in general that also have multiple sclerosis, that you can tell them who they can call to get the help that they might need to, to go forward and be able to live better and just feel better about themselves and everything of what they're doing rather than feeling like they have to get depressed because they don't know where to go to for the information. So we want to make this available. And again, we're starting with one social worker, and we hope that within a couple of years, we can build a team of these social workers, so that way we're not just doing it in the state of Florida, but we're expanding out, and we can you know, receive calls from all over the country. So thank you for your time on that. <laughs>